Welcome back to our continuing journey through the story. You might remember that we began three weeks ago. The story, which is a condensed chronological version of the Bible. And we'll be journeying through it for several months, all the way until springtime. All the stories in the Bible are telling one big story, how God created and loves his children, how we, his children, have fallen away from God. But God has a plan to bring us back into relationship with him by sending us a Savior. Now you know that that Savior is going to be human as well as divine, and the human Savior needs a family, a village, a nation to be born into. Last week, we saw that God began to build that nation with the call of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jacob, you might remember, has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel is that special nation chosen by God to receive God's law, God's prophets, God's Messiah, the Savior. And every story whispers his name. Today we're going to look at the story of Joseph, who was one of the 12 sons. And that story might be familiar to many of you. I first learned it as Joseph and his coat of many colors, later known as Joseph and his amazing technicolor dream coat. It might be new to some of you, but whether it's new or old to you, let's ask questions of the story as we go through it today. Questions like, what is God teaching me about God? What is God teaching me about people? What is God teaching me about myself in this story? And then how does this story fit into the bigger story of God's plan to send a Savior to bring us back to him? What was Joseph's part in building that special nation who would one day receive the Messiah? What about Joseph makes us think of Jesus? What in the story of Joseph whispers his name? We want to begin in Genesis chapter 37. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So when the Midianite merchants merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Well, here is the beginning of the story of Joseph, the beloved son of his father. And we think he's only about age 17 at this point when his father who considers him his favorite, made a beautiful robe for him. Besides having the best clothes in the family, Joseph also has the biggest dreams in the family. Joseph had dreams of his family bowing down to him. And he maybe wasn't so wise because he told them about his dreams. That did not endear him to his brothers, who were already jealous of his amazing technicolor dream coat. So Joseph's brothers sell him for 20 pieces of silver into slavery and tell Jacob that Joseph was killed by a ferocious animal. Joseph's own family sell him to the Ishmaelites, who take him as a slave down to Egypt. And so the beloved son is rejected by his own and sold for silver. So let's ask the questions so far in the story. How does this fit into the big picture of God building a nation, a people to receive the Savior, the Messiah? Joseph is one of the leaders in that family. And we don't know yet how things will turn out for him. Is there anything about Joseph that sounds like Jesus? Joseph, the beloved son of his father, 
rejected by his own, and sold for silver. Every story whispers his name. And then, what is God teaching me in this story? Family estrangement can happen through disagreements over money, inheritance, lifestyle choices, religion, divorce. The list is endless. Sometimes we long for acceptance by our own family of origin. But sometimes rejection by our own family, as painful as it is, is the very thing that frees us for God's larger purpose. That we will see as the story of Joseph continues to unfold in Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. She reported to her husband that Joseph tried to seduce her. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, we will see that the Lord is still with him. Joseph is sold as a slave into an Egyptian administrator's family named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph and falsely accuses Joseph of assaulting her. And so falsely accused, the trusted servant becomes the innocent condemned and imprisoned. How does this part of Joseph's story fit into the bigger story of God building a people of his own? It looks like God abandoned Joseph, but the Lord was with Joseph. That is a repeated refrain in the Joseph story, even when he seems abandoned. Is there anything that reminds you of Jesus, who himself felt abandoned by God on the cross? A trusted servant, falsely accused, innocent, condemned, yet God was with him. What is God teaching me in this story? I will sometimes suffer even when I am innocent. God is my witness. God is my defender. God is the one who will take care of me. We are outraged when we hear stories of innocent people being condemned, and we can imagine what this was like for Joseph. Suffering in prison, we don't know, maybe between two years and ten years for a crime that he was not guilty of. One of my nephews is an investigative reporter, and he has written a book called Good Kids, Bad City, which is about three teenagers in Cleveland who were convicted of a murder they did not commit, and then were in prison for 35 years. And my nephew was an investigator who discovered some evidence that he turned over to the Innocence Project, which was instrumental in having those three men released from prison. Two of them came to my nephew's wedding that I officiated at. 
And we sat and talked to them and asked, aren't you so bitter for all of that time that you spent in prison? And you know what they said? They said, well, we could be bitter, but we would rather be grateful for every day of freedom that we have now. That's the difference it makes in trusting your way to the Lord. We will see as we continue in Genesis 39 how Joseph entrusted his way to the Lord and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. While Joseph was in prison, he got the reputation for correctly interpreting prisoners' dreams. One of the prisoners was returned to Pharaoh's service, just as Joseph said he would be. Joseph is used in prison to reveal God's plan. Later, when Pharaoh had a dream which none of his wise men could interpret for him, he sent for Joseph. Pharaoh dreamt of seven fat cows being swallowed by seven skinny cows. Joseph explained that the dream meant Egypt would have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph is used to reveal God's plan to save people, and he counsels Pharaoh to prepare. Pharaoh recognizes Joseph's unique wisdom from God and makes him deputy Pharaoh, an exalted ruler, sent to save the whole nation. Does anything in this part of the story remind us of Jesus? one who reveals God's plan to save people, an exalted ruler appointed to save his people. Now, Egypt is not the nation that the Savior will be born into. So what does rescuing Egypt have to do with God's special people? Well, all the surrounding nations come to Joseph, come to Egypt, to be saved because that is the only place where there is food. Joseph's brothers come to Egypt and ask for food. Joseph immediately recognizes them, although they don't recognize him. He looks like an Egyptian ruler to them. But he recognizes his brothers even though it's been 20 years since he has seen them and he reveals himself to them in a very poignant part of the story from Genesis 45. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Here is Joseph, no longer the weak one being sold into slavery, but the all-powerful ruler. And Joseph is the one who forgives the offenders. The brothers do bow down to Joseph, just as Joseph dreamed they would one day. And Joseph has the power to crush them. 
but he does not take revenge on his brothers. And our question is, why? This is his opportunity. Joseph is convinced that God is working his purposes within the ups and downs of his own personal life. Joseph sees how his story, even his story of being enslaved by his own brothers, imprisoned unfairly, fits in to God's bigger story to protect this family that God will make into a great nation. God made provision through Joseph to save the new fledgling nation during severe famine. Joseph understood that God was at work in the new nation and that God will reveal himself through it. What is God teaching me in this story? That amazing statement of Joseph's, you intended to harm me, but God meant it for good to save many lives. Am I convinced that God is working his purposes even when people are against me? Do I believe Romans 8, 28, that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him? Joseph, the all-powerful one, forgives the offenders, saves and reunites the forgiven family with their father by bringing them all down to Egypt. Within Egypt, the Israelites grew to a great nation of over a million people. Now we see how Joseph's story fits into the bigger story. And we see glimpses of Jesus, the beloved son who was rejected, but before whom one day every knee shall bow, the one who forgives offenders, the one who saves and reunites God's forgiven family, and the one who brings great joy to the Father. Let's find our story in his story. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.